I will briefly introduce uh, Chris, who is our moderator. Um, Chris is, leads the Global Partnership Division in the Office of Innovation and Development Alliances as UACID, where he's the director, which uh, provides a role in terms of impact-driven partnerships with the private sector. Uh, USI, uh, his group has been one of the uh, partners for the BCT and one of the most active sort of champions of the BCT work also. Um, he oversees this Global Development Alliance team, and before that, he used to be Director of Global Programs for Accenture Development Partnership, and great to have you. Thank you, Saba, and good morning, everyone. Um, really pleased to be here, and let me start by saying uh, that USAID is proud to be a supporter of BCTA and a partner with BCTA, and indeed partner with many of the organizations uh, in the room here today. Um, as an agency, we believe passionately in the role of the private sector in driving sustainable development outcomes and in creating a world where aid agencies like USAID um, are no longer needed. So we say our driving interest in engaging with the private sector is to help you grow your business inclusively, of course, so we can put ourselves out of business. Uh, and this is a notion that Secretary Clinton reaffirmed in her speech yesterday at CGI and Administrator Shaw um, regular commits to. So our, our mission is development impact and as opposed to the business drivers of many companies here, uh, planned obsolescence. Um, and that's reflected in the work we do. So via our Global Development Alliance, a program that um, my office runs, we've created more than a thousand partnerships with private sector organizations, um, leveraging $9 billion in public and private resources on projects that marry development impact and, and business results. Um, and we're pursuing a range of new initiatives like the G8 commitment um, uh, announced by President Obama this year, uh, the, the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition in Africa, which are trying to bring together host country governments, donor agencies, the private sector and civil society to solve problems on a, on a bigger scale. So all that to just say we're, we're passionate about this cause and, and ha thrilled to have the opportunity to be part of this uh, panel today. I think we have a fantastic group. Um, the first panel this morning focused on some really innovative individual uh, in, uh, inclusive business models and I think we want to build on that today and with the panelists we have here talk no, not only about the, the business models that they've uh, employed but also this notion of how do you create an enabling environment for uh, inclusive business. Uh, Sigrid spoke to the need to have an ecosystem of stakeholders involved and the role that donor gov governments can play, civil society can play, specialized organizations uh, like BCTA can play to foster an environment where um, inclusive business can grow and to address some of the particular challenges, whether that's the, the policy environment, uh, access to finance to drive inclusive business or the skills and, and awareness to, to learn from each other. Um, so that's what we hear about today, and we have a few organizations that directly uh, implement um, inclusive business in their businesses, uh, as well as a view from uh, government and from a business alliance focused specifically on driving business towards the MDGs. Um, so I'll start with a brief introduction of our panelists. Um, and kudos to BCTA for um, the geographic diversity of this panel. We have six people representing six continents. So I fully expect next year we'll have an Antarctic uh, inclusive business to, to round this out. Uh, ideally a woman so we get our gender balance a bit better. Um, but a great panel here. So let me start to my left. Uh, Yomi Awobukan is the CEO of Awanda Marketing. You heard a bit about uh, Awando from uh, Saba. Uh, it's a Nigeria's leading en integrated energy company. Uh, he's been with Awanda since 2005 and also served as COO and head of investor relations and we'll hear more about Oanda's commitment to promoting inclusive business through its uh, LGB, uh, LPG clean cooking stoves as, as well as other things. Uh, next we have Eduardo Ferreira from Itau, uh, the largest Latin American bank. Um, he's CEO of Microinvest or Itau Microcredit, uh, the organization's um, uh, initiative to extend access to finance to the base of the pyramid uh, in, in Brazil and across Latin America. Uh, John Samuel from uh, head of social performance at Anglo-American, uh, an economist by background, and his current role focuses on enhancing the social performance of Anglo-Americans mining and smelting operations uh, around the world. Um, then we have Dia Saminarsi, the deputy to the Indonesian president's special envoy uh, on the MDGs. Um, she has a background in the private sector, 
Um, but her current role, uh, she oversees multiple programs where the Indonesian government is really bringing together a platform for the private sector, civil society, and government to engage on addressing the MDGs. Uh, and we'll hear more about that. Uh, and finally, um, always Australia last in the furthest time zone, apologies. Um, Mark Ingram, CEO of Business for Millennium Development, which is a, a really innovative Australian alliance focused on uh, advancing the role of Australian business in addressing the MDGs and, and fostering a Antipodean uh, inclusive business uh, ecosystem. Um, so, Yomi, let me start with you, and could you speak to uh, Oanda's business, what you're doing to advance inclusive business, and sort of what partners you've worked with in the inclusive business environment in Nigeria to, to make that happen? Thanks, Chris, um, and hello, everybody. Um, let me start with a little background um, of, of our inclusive business before I go to the partners. We are um, an energy group. Uh, I am uh, CEO of the marketing company. And essentially our business, our inclusive business is to create uh, clean cook stoves for uh, the bottom of the pyramid. Um, essentially every stove will speak to a one household. In Nigeria, there's probably 90% of the households in Nigeria don't use uh, clean energy. They use charcoal or kerosene or firewood uh, for domestic use. Uh, we're targeting 5% um, of that. We're targeting 5 million of, those, of that space. Uh, essentially, uh, we've spent two years creating the, the product, um, and, and now we've just rolled out the product. We're about uh, nine months old. Uh, you know, rolling out that product, we've, we've sold about uh, 50,000, so 50,000 homes already have our product, have our stoves, and we're going to uh, 100,000 in the first year, and then 5 million over, over a five-year period. As far as partners are concerned, we're working with, um, first, first and foremost, the government, federal government, and then working with uh, the local governments, local government agencies, the ministries of environment, ministries of trade and investment, and working with uh, socially conscious funds, so DFIs, if we can call them that, Deutsche Bank, uh, we're always looking for money, um, KFW, ACAD, um, um, DFID, uh, so those are some of the partners that we're working with. What makes our product, our business uh, innovative is that it comes with uh, financing. So the way it works is that we, we've made the product, we've taken it to the market, and we are trying to sell the stoves through new entrepreneurs, new micro-entrepreneurs who don't exist. Uh, and by doing that, allow them to start to trade and, and earn some income. Over a five-year period, if we get this right, potentially every entrepreneur could earn up to $1,000 a month. Uh, essentially, these are people who don't earn up to a dollar a day at the moment. Uh, and the key driver is their ability to access financing, to be able to buy the stoves and sell, whether uh, for cash or through some form of credit to the end consumer. Who's used to credit today for the kerosene that they use? And so that financing is the most innovative part of this, uh, of this product. And essentially that is how the inclusive business model is being developed. Great, thanks, Yemi. Uh, Eduardo, turning to you, uh, could you talk a little bit about Ital's work in inclusive business unit in, inside a, uh, a large uh, bank across Latin America? Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, to this invitation. It's a great honor to be here and in the name of Tony Banco, share our pleasure in being a new member of BCTA's global relation, uh, relation, leadership platform. Just to contextualize, Itaú Unibanco is the biggest bank in Brazil in market value and among the 15 largest banks in the world, operating in 19 countries with one 100,000 employees. We are the only financial institution in Latin America listing Dow Jones Sustainability Index since its inception in 1999. And this year, 2012, we were recognized by IFC and Financial Times, the most sustainable bank in Latin America. Tao's objective is to establish sustainable, long-lasting relationship that transforms society. And we strongly believe that microfinance plays an important role in offering solutions directly related to the Millennium Development Goals. Microfinance supports increased access to goods and services and investment in financial literacy, 
leading to better income opportunities and job creation. Challenging paradigms, our business model takes the bank to the client. Our law officers, trained to be multipliers of financial literacy, encourage business best press with the microentrepreneur notebook, a step-by-step -step introduction to cash flow management. So proximity between law officer and client and focus in education lead to a conscious use of credit. Itaú Unibanco, at Itaú Unibanco, the committee to microfinance is equivalent to a portfolio of 160 million resource set aside for investment in first and second tier microfinance operations. But the challenge related to this investment aren't micro. In Brazil, the financial system is still unable to offer an adequate basket of products and services to a large slice of the, port, uh, the population. According to a Brazilian economic think tank, the informal economy is equivalent to 18.2% of the Brazilian GDP. Multiple actors in society can contribute to improve this scenario. The government, for example, is heading a project that encourages the formalization of microentrepreneurs, facilitating access to benefits such as welfare. By the end of 2011, 1.8 million microentrepreneurs had adhered to the program, investing only 50 cents per day to maintain their new formal status. Itaú, a bank with vast experience in consumer credit, is aware of its power of transformation. Tens of millions of clients with fixed income, even those at the base of the economic pyramid, have contracted credit cards and benefits and benefited from partnerships with large retailers. But microfinance operation can take it further. Our slogan is, the world is constantly changing and it will change with you. It is confident in its ability to change the two big barriers to inclusion, information asymmetry and high transaction cost. Itaú's size and commercial strategy should allow the microfinance operation to gain scale, decreasing the transaction cost. Moreover, Itaú's financial capacity allows the microfinance unit department to experiment with innovative technological tools such as geostatistics and hybrid credit analysis model. On the other hand, the microfinance operation also gives back to the bank our branchless and paperless business model, generating knowledge about the base of the economic pyramid and valuable lessons take from our client-oriented relationship. The end, a win-win situation that transforms the bank and the society. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Eduardo. Turning it to John, uh, Anglo has long been a, a leader in inclusive business through initiatives like Anglo's Amele. So uh, where have you been? Where are you going in terms of inclusive business? And, and how do you think about partnerships in this context? OK, thank you. Um, well, firstly, for those that don't know, Anglo American is a multinational mining company. And about 85% of our 70 or so operations are based in emerging markets. Uh, we mostly produce industrial commodities, but the bit of us you've probably heard of is De Beers. Um, uh, you'll be relieved to hear that our inclusive business model isn't trying to sell diamonds to the poor. It's more about trying to get small businesses into our local supply chains. And it also, in particular, um, uh, looking at things like small business development programs to facilitate that. Sometimes where we go, we don't have much in the way of a local supply chain, so we're looking to support that through various means. We also look to try and uh, do things like hire locally and train people locally so they can work on our minds. But I'll focus mostly on our business call to action commitment here, which is to create 15,000 additional jobs in our small business development programs by 2015. So um, we've been working on this since the late 1980s, actually. And um, Chris uh, mentioned Anglo-American Zumeli, which is our small business development program in South Africa, 
which was started with a focus to try and support black entrepreneurs uh, get into our supply chains back in the late 1980s. Um, since then, we've expanded as the group has expanded internationally, so we have similar programs in South America, and we've actually got quite a big push at the moment to try and expand those programs more broadly. And at the moment, we're supporting about 38,000 businesses, and they, between them, have created about 47,000 jobs, which create, uh, compares with about 100,000 jobs in our own core business. So they're quite substantial impacts we can have by using our supply chain. In terms of who we've worked with. We started off on our own actually in South Africa at the time. There wasn't anybody to work with. Uh, and Zameli has been successful. Um, it's probably worth saying that compared to the opportunities available to us now, it took a long time and a lot of resources to get to the point where Zameli itself in South Africa supports about 20,000 jobs. We've achieved something similar in Chile in about a quarter of the time by partnering with NGOs. So um, as we look to expand our programs, we're particularly looking uh, to work with delivery NGOs of one form or another, so people like TechnoServe and Care International, for example, but also some local NGOs. Um, we have had some interactions with donors and government agencies, so we got some money from the UK Department for International Development to support the growth of Zameli, for example. Interestingly, that was quite difficult for us. We didn't provide the sort of information that they needed, even though Zameli was run according to our own corporate governance standards. So we thought we were providing robust financial data, but actually we weren't providing the sort of impact information that they needed to justify that funding. So that's a lesson for us. And then more recently, we're looking to uh, work with banks. Many of the commercial banks, such as Ital and, and several others, are increasingly active in this area as are some of the impact investment funds as well. So we see opportunities to work with them, bring some of their financial expertise in. We know our supply chain. We don't pretend to be great experts in small business. Anglo-American probably has more in tune with some governments than most small businesses in terms of how it's operated. And that's true for very many businesses. In terms of, sort of the enabling environment and the gaps and what are needed, I think it's probably worth saying that most of the things that we need as a, a big long-term investor that sinks billions of dollars into new projects probably actually apply to small businesses and the companies we're trying to support. And actually, they probably apply even more to them than they do to us. So it's things like a clear application of the rule of law, a sensible regulatory environment that's stable but is deemed to be fair by stakeholders. Um, a stable fiscal environment, which again is deemed to be fair in terms of returns to government, but also which does sort of provide the incentives for investment, good infrastructure and, and well-educated people. And those are things that actually uh, the donor community has been very engaged on for very many years, and that's very helpful and, and good work, and it should continue. Um, in terms of what we can do, of course, we're limited by our expertise and the resource we're able to devote for this. And I do think there's, um, and, and we're a large company who've been doing it and believe in it, so there are, there are lots of other businesses out there who are perhaps not as aware of the opportunities as we are. And I do think there's a role for some of the donors and indeed some of the NGOs here. So, for example, acting as centres of expertise, there is a lot of information that's being gathered through initiatives like Business Call to Action. Um, when you actually start talking to the bilateral donors, who will be the easiest donors for many companies to engage with, actually there's not much expertise in them. Uh, and so I think there are issues around training, around sharing case studies, and even perhaps recruiting people from business who understand exactly how businesses work, and perhaps offering secondments. They can actually go in and design those programs within that company. Because although companies, you know, we're often seen as a sector, we all tend to run ourselves in quite different ways. And you need to know how a company ticks before you can really design a program for it. I think it's important to be flexible with companies that are trying to do the right things. Quite often, for understandable governance reasons, donors will set out eligibility criteria by which companies can engage with them, or specific countries. I think there are some donors now that are becoming quite flexible. So um, GIZ, for example, has got a public-private partnership program, which is that then they're actually quite entrepreneurial. They come to you and hunt out opportunities where they can take something you're doing and leverage it and make it bigger. And then some of the government institutions. So in Brazil, for example, we've worked with uh, the national training uh, agency, SENAI, which is one of the biggest vocational training organizations in the world. And they have actually come into our mining localities and worked with us to develop uh, technical training centers, so, which has been very helpful for us, but also clearly gets a big win for local communities. I think being prepared to take some of the risk, we're doing this in business, and you know, anyone who's investing, if you want some of the credit, whether it's reputational or financial, you should be accepting some of the potential downside of that. Uh, and then match funding. I think actually one of the things companies find hardest to put to these kind of schemes is actually 
match funding, whether that's grants or whether that's loans. And again, I think some, particularly in the early phases, helping companies with that kind of sort of risk sharing can be very useful. And then also sometimes in some of the countries where we are, there aren't implementation partners. So I think a final op opportunity might be to do with helping service delivery partners emerge. And, and they may be NGOs or they may be local private companies themselves. But I would echo what Rick Cooper was saying earlier about don't give NGOs money to give away because that doesn't create a sustainable model. We've had a couple of schemes we would like to have done, which actually we couldn't have done because um, actually we were up against donor-backed uh, sort of grant-based schemes where actually we thought there was a much more sustainable long-term model. So. Um, so turning to Dia, uh, how is inclusive business manifesting in the Indonesian context? And can you talk a bit about uh, what your office is doing from the government perspective to build a platform for uh, inclusive business and collaboration between civil society, government, and, and business? Um, okay, thank you for um, inviting me to be able to speak in this panel. It's such an honor to be here. Um, before I start um, introducing what we do um, for inclusive business, <coughs> Um, my office, the, the office I work for now, is set up by the President of the Republic of Indonesia as sort of like a um, task force. This office has the mandate to expedite um, and, if possible, help um, motivate and um, make the achievement of MDG target possible for Indonesia, which is a big, big, big job um, to be achieved um, in the period of five years, because this office wasn't set up until the beginning of 2010. But um, we realized that um, actually without this office, um, all of the other development stakeholders nationally has done so much um, throughout the years. And um, it's, it, it becomes the question of how to um, Pull the, pull the separate resources together, make them collaborate, um, get to know each other, communicate with each other, um, know as simple as where should we contact one NGO, where is the contact person of that private sector. That is um, the challenge that we had to start with because um, the uh, government, as I think, um, anywhere else in the world tends to work in silos. And um, we don't, the government don't communicate well with private sector. They do not communicate well with the NGO. And sometimes, more often than not, they try to um, stay away from the NGOs. Um, so communication wasn't there. Um, um, sense of belonging and uh, sense of ownership wasn't um, uniform in each of the stakeholder. So with, with that big challenge, and then as we progress, then as you know, Indonesia is rolling into universal health coverage, and now the president is with the high-level panel of eminent persons, then the challenge increased over time. Uh, so it, 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 uh, our, our job just um, now is to create an, a platform, a model, where every stakeholder can um, jump in and know which exactly what are expected out of them, what, who is accountable, uh, who will do the monitoring and evaluation, who will um, decide within that platform uh, what, what funding needs to be um, channeled and what to do. So again, back on um, MDG achievement, the question is how to achieve MDG within that short period of time. But if not, at least we are on the right track of expediting um, that achievement to happen. Uh, we focus on health, naturally, on health and nutrition with um, women and children at the core of that model, and also the use of IT. And we want to um, harness the collaborative effort from our domestic resources, which then we turn into private sector collaboration. Uh, so we have this mapping. Um, we do our homework and we create this mapping of exactly what is being done by private sector partners, by NGO partners, and uh, throughout Indonesia. Indonesia is a very big uh, country 
240 million population with 17,000 different islands. So we created the mapping of who is working where, which NGO is where, which private sector is where. And we then from there um, make a gap analysis uh, where, where is the gap existed, where is the gap existed in infrastructure um, as far as um, providing access to clean water and sanitation, where is the gap in infrastructure, where, where do areas that uh, cannot be accessed with four wheels drive because it matters. When, when women died in delivery, um, it matters where is the location of her home. Um, and then where, where is energy still insufficient? Where is um, infrastructure, mobile infrastructure is still not there yet, even for SMS like uh, Dieter pointed out. So uh, the, uh, then we engage private sector. After that model is um, set up along with our private sector partners, uh, we engage them and we encourage their um, participation in that model, which they think, which area they think they can give um, value more, which will add value to the people as well as adding value uh, to their corporations. Uh, so it, it's a partnerships of um, both ways. And all of the partners in the, in the model, in, in our initiative, um, are aware that this is a movement as, it's, it's a bigger thing than just a partnership for profit or for value added. It's a movement for, from the people to the people. That way it will make it more sustainable um, it will create, it will harness um, participation even from the um, community themselves, from the regional government as well as from the national government. Um, I take one example, um, Nokia Life, uh, which are, which we will roll out um, by the end of the year is, um, initially it will impact only um, about 15,000 households. Um, so about 60,000 people in total, but it will be scaled up into a national level. And that um, uh, location where we piloted the program is open as a lab or as um, a learning um, location for everyone in the partnership, including the government, including the CSO and the development partners um, involved. Uh, so uh, it becomes, um, a model not from the government to the people, but from all of us. So it's the trust is there, the accountability is there, um, the transparency is there as well, and we engage the media, lastly, uh, to um, help us distribute the information um, to the public. And we invite regional government then to um, engage us if they want their locations to be the location of the pilot programs for the second and the third batch. And then the national level then scaled up into a, a, a movement of the people for the MDG and for the post-MDG period. So that way we hope the sustainability aspect is safeguarded. Um, it will not be um, program oriented, so it's not we, we do not think in, in two-year terms or three-year term. It's, it's um, slowly growing, growing until it reaches the national level scale that we want it to reach. Thank you. Mark, turning to you, I mean, B4MD is a great example of an organization advancing inclusive businesses core to what your mission is. So, so what are you doing and, and how are you partnering with others? with the specific purpose of creating inclusive business in the Australian setting. So I'll just share a brief history of that journey. And it's meant that we, by necessity, work with government, work with the NGO community, work with the business community. Our founding members are companies in Australia like Telstra, Oil Search, which has a large oil and gas operation in Papua New Guinea, uh, Vizi, which is the world's largest privately owned packaging company, uh, food companies like Sanitarium, Goodman Fielder, and so forth. But we also deal with multinationals domiciled 
in Australia which have regional jurisdictions like IBM, Coca-Cola, ExxonMobil, and uh, uh, Chris knows our connection with Accenture. Our chairman was Australian of the Year last year. Simon McKeon is a investment banker with Macquarie. So he last year spent a lot of time uh, promoting the idea of inclusive business when he had his speeches around the country. We're quite unique because we have the ability to act on behalf of uh, developing communities. Often our clients, our private sector members, ask us to make connections. Uh, mining companies might have communities surrounding their operations and we link them with corporates to form inclusive businesses. An example would be ExxonMobil Corporation in Papua New Guinea uh, utilising our services to create a poultry business with a large food company in Australia so that local smallholder farmers could get into a value chain uh, not only to supply their own work camps but the general market. So we have three fundamental roles. One is to act as a catalyst. We'll go proactively out to industry and ask them to look at business opportunities in the developing world. Uh, we coordinate. Often when you build a supply chain, you need logistics, you need packaging, you need finance, you need um, the core operational exp expertise. Typically an agribusiness has been our mainstay. Uh, and we actually co-create the business model. Uh, so we'll go into depth into looking at the financials, the internal rates of return, the um, volume of production, and other metrics to help the company uh, that we're talking to think through the business opportunity. So uh, the last five years has gone something like this. We were formed middle of 2007 around the campaign of an uh, Australian politician who became Prime Minister called Kevin Rudd. Kevin Rudd was very committed to the Millennium Goals and set about the task for Australia to achieve 0.7% of GNI. Uh, that has wavered a little bit in the last few years. Uh, Kevin Rudd is no longer Prime Minister of Australia, but he set a new trajectory for Australia in terms of our international obligations. Uh, that was really good time to then introduce our organisation off the back of that platform. However, then we had the global financial crisis come upon us, and while Australia weathered the storm better than most economies, uh, it did cause the corporate community to batten down the hatches a fair bit. Uh, what we did find, though, is that that challenged CSR, traditional CSR, far more than the idea of inclusive business, where as long as it's driven by profit, you'll be able to uh, withstand your commitment uh, regarding uh, financial conditions. Um, the Australian government has, was one of the first business call to action signatories in 2008. Uh, today, there is a strong commitment for business engagement. Probably the best example I can give you is in Indonesia near neighbour to Australia, a vital bilateral trading partner. There's a rural development program AusAid have just launched called AIPD Rural, that's Australia-Indonesia Partnership for Development. The 112 million will be used to fund about 80 different interventions, as they call it in development speak, uh, but handing out uh, assistance in terms of funding or capacity where there's limitations for companies to build linkages with smallholder farmers. And that program is very closely uh, formed in collaboration with the Indonesian government. So uh, it's exciting times in our part of the world. Uh, we've been slow to move into this space. Uh, glad to see our first member, uh, Barefoot Power, uh, registering with uh, the BCTA, and glad to see that we're moving forward. Uh, so, while we do awareness raising, we also take business missions in country and we've taken groups of companies into Papua New Guinea, desperately poor country, impossible to achieve the MDGs, some of the highest child and uh, maternal mortality rates in the world, uh, but Australian companies dominate in that country. So we thought that that would be the first port of call and we've got a platform now in Papua New Guinea of building agribusinesses. 
Uh, we're also into Indonesia and we entered the market in May. We're setting up a country office in Jakarta. And again, what we're finding uh, a key strength is in how we get smallholder farmers to get their produce out to markets. One of the initiatives we're looking at is a member company of Coca-Cola Corporation, where we're looking at mango farmers where about 20% of their production is just waste, but that can be used for pulping and forming into purees that can be used in final retail products for Coke. Uh, the, some of the, just summarising some of the barriers we face, we're very isolated. It took me 35 hours to fly here, uh, <laughs> leaving Sunday evening and arriving last night, so I'm still floating in the air somewhere. And uh, that does mean it's hard for us to be in, uh, connected with what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, it also means that the definition of national interest is often the beaches of Australia, and we don't think much beyond that. Uh, so it's a learning curve for Australia to become a more uh, global citizen. Uh, our aid ag agency has been very traditionalist in its use of aid, but as I say, this year has seen a real change. There was an aid effectiveness review last year which said that the agency is lacking in its engagement with business, so there's a real push from the Director General down to change that. Uh, AusAid's about $5.5 in Aid makes them close to one of the top 10 donors in the world, and their trajectory is moving towards 0.5% of GNI out to 2015. Uh, the NGO community in Australia has been quite anti-business, and the, my final remark would be, I would consider the, the greatest limiter to inclusive business in Australia and most developed countries is mindset. It's ideological. It's the sense for most people that charity or aid or philanthropy is the best way of targeting poverty rather than looking at profit motive. Profit is often considered a dirty word, uh, but when it's creating shared profit for both communities and for companies, we shouldn't discourage that. Great, thank you, Mark. Turning back um, to some of our other panelists on that mindset question, as we look towards creating ecosystems for inclusive business, how mature is this concept in the countries where you're working? Many of the organizations in this room have been working on it for a long time. It doesn't seem that new anymore. But when you go beyond some of the leading companies, uh, as well as government and civil society stakeholders, the core idea of inclusive business, of, of marrying development impact and sustainable business models and business, is that mainstream yet in your country? Are businesses thinking this way? Would be one question. Um, and then second question, um, you know, what, if, if that's not the case, what are some of the things the organizations in this room can do to either raise awareness or, or tear down some of the, the barriers? Maybe starting with you, Yim. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, let, me, let, me, let me give you some background about, about Nigeria. It's uh, 158 million people at the last count. Um, it's... Uh, 47% of that population with access to intermittent uh, electricity. It's uh, over 55 people um, earning less than or about a dollar a day. It's poor in infrastructure. There's, there's hardly any water. Uh, healthcare it needs a lot of help. Um, spent about uh, spent about 20 billion dollars or thereabout on on fuel subsidy last year. Uh, huge issues, you know, 25% uh, unemployment. Literally every sector uh, is in need of help. Uh, and the government is, is struggling to, the government is, is, the, is the soul of the country and it's struggling to, to you know, put things right. Uh, so when you talk about mindset, the mindset is miles away from inclusive businesses. At the moment, uh, nobody's thinking about, uh, about, about, you know, bottom of the pyramid, or businesses fall at the bottom of the pyramid. Everybody is looking for daily bread, uh, if I can call it that. Um, and every every uh, every agency or every every industry feeds off whatever the government dishes out, uh, you know, to survive. So we're in the oil and gas industry. The government controls the mining licenses. The government controls uh, licensing for distribution, and it's the same in every industry. Uh, so this. You know, business call to action, um, inclusive business models, 
to be honest with you, they're, they're the jargon for, for the West, if I can call them that. The West and probably uh, the BRIC nations. We're, we're pretty far from that. Where we are is a mindset of survival. Uh, and I'm talking about everybody, regardless of the color of their suit. Uh, so the mindset in Nigeria isn't one uh, at the moment that is uh, encouraging uh, development of inclusive business models for, for, for you know, bottom of the pyramid entrepreneurs or, or anything like that. It's, 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 it's one in which uh, everybody's trying to survive. Our driver is, is, is largely commercial. As you know, we, uh, we are an oil and gas nation um, and we, we have more gas reserves than we have crude oil, even though crude oil is the mainstay of the economy. A lot of the LPG, uh, indeed all the gas, uh, most of the gas being produced is associated and fled and destroyed with, with the production. Um, and so there's a lot of effort or a lot of talk and a blueprint by the government to ensure that that gas is used uh, positively for the economy. Nigeria consumed 125,000 tons of LPG in 20, 2011 compared to Ghana, who's a uh, 30% of our population who consumed 400,000 tons. So put that into perspective. It's, it's miles away from where it can be, and the, 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 the substitute, what the population in Nigeria uses is largely firewood. Uh, we have the fastest rate of deforestation, uh, probably anywhere on the continent or in the world. Um, and and the, the trouble with firewood, though, is that it's a tropical country, so we've got rain six months of the year. So there's a rush to chop down the trees and then it's hoarded and kept in the homes of, of potential resellers. And that creates a, a black market. So even though firewood is destroying the economy and destroying the forests, it's not cheap to access. Neither is kerosene. Kerosene is subsidized. Kerosene subsidy last year cost the government $6 billion uh, to subsidize the kerosene for the, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the users. But what happens is, because kerosene has other uses, largely uh, used also for jet fuel, for airplanes, it finds its way into the country with good intentions and then into a black market that fuels jets. And so the prices go all the way back up. So that subsidy essentially is put in the pockets of a few people who control the value chain, the supply chain. So from a mindset point of view, I can go on and on uh, and talk about reasons why uh, at the moment, the mindset is miles away from, from inclusive business models or supporting those models. I mean, our, our project uh, you know, sits well with our own commercial uh, objectives because uh, the average per capita use of LPG in Nigeria last year was 3 kg per capita. The, uh, the equivalent in Ghana is 40 kg per capita. Uh, you know, and, and, and understand that we're probably four or five times the population of Ghana. Ghana uses it for everything, including vehicles. We don't even use it to cook at the moment. Uh, and mostly in Nigeria, it's the, it's the women that cook because it's quite a traditional society. So the, 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 the gender that is most affected by the dirty fuels, those most affected to indoor pollution, are women and young children. Uh, and it's the men who typically would sell the fuel. They're the ones who usually are the more entrepreneurial. And so our project sits well because on the one hand it addresses uh, you know, a, a business model where the men can do more you know, positive work. And on the other hand, it, 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 it stops killing our, our wives and our kids uh, you know, as, they, as they seek to build homes. You know, um, and every bottle we sell essentially is, is a household Product. It's not one to one. It's actually one to a household of four to five people. So um, it's it's a it's a it's a you know it's a massive paradigm shift. You know, introducing an LPG cook stove. Uh, you know, trying to teach uh, the inclusive business model in what we're pushing to the market. Trying to talk about the financing to ensure that the entrepreneurs understand. You know, what it is to keep the books. You know, uh, lend some, get some money off microfinance banks you know, trade with it and pay it back. Uh, and, and I think the sort of support that we would, we're looking forward to is initiatives like this. Uh, for us to, uh, you know, listen to what other companies are doing in other parts of the world, the Indonesian example is something that we've studied uh, in our company, uh, and we always take that to the government whenever we're seeking their support to say, look, this is what Indonesia is doing, and it's worked pretty well. It's saved the government money. It's allowed the government to invest uh, capital 
to, you know, to infrastructure whilst encouraging the private sector to build models that allow more people to get jobs, more people to earn money, more people get off the poverty ladder. You know, uh, you know some of the solutions that we need, uh, some of the companies here in the countries that you work in and live in have already, you know, have already implemented them. So that is, that is huge. In addition to that, we're also looking for more financing. Uh, we find that there's no long money. We're not going to switch Nigeria, 158 million people, uh, with all its issues uh, to LPG in a minute. Uh, you know, there's a lot of risk we're taking, and we're looking for uh, development finance that is interested in taking those risks with us, uh, not necessarily on our behalf, we're saying with us, you know, um, you know and also teach us you know, there's some capacity building as we go along. So we're looking for some development finance. Uh, we're looking for uh, avenues for development in terms of skill set. Understand that um, LPG, for example, the distribution network that, that, that is required is just being built. We need more engineers. We need more capacity development. Uh, those bottles um, have simple things that can be produced in Nigeria. At the moment, a lot of those bottles are brought in from abroad. One of the things we're trying to do is ensure that by year two of our project, we have those bottles developed locally in Nigeria, thereby creating more jobs. Uh, but to do that, there's a massive skills gap you know, that must be breached. Uh, we need some support from that, you know, from, from some of the companies in this room in that area. And fundamentally, um, some examples of the policies that your countries have formulated that we could replicate in Nigeria to guide and aid the movement, uh, you know, the, the paradigm shift that some of our leaders need to, need to come into to allow these initiatives to grow and to stabilize and essentially allow us to win uh, at the end of the period. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Yomi. So, uh, miles still to go on the mindset. I mean, maybe turning to Eduardo and, and Dia to, to talk about the Brazil and, and Indonesia context. Do you think similar places, Nigeria, or you see uh, it in different places? Uh, in my opinion, Brazil is quite different because of Brazil, in one hand, we have a very strong economy. We have a, a strong base of credit, not only credit cards, but credit, debit, and uh, private label cards. We have something like three cards per habitant in Brazil. And we have more than one mobile phone per habitant. So, and something like 80% of our population live in the cities. So we are a kind of urban country. But in the other hand, we have something like 18% of our GDP is informal. I mean, so big difference. And for many years, in my opinion, uh, we don't have a kind of inclusive business model. We have a lot of social investment, mm -hmm. but not business, really business model. In the last maybe 10 years or five years, this model is changing. Now we are looking for a sustainable business model. So uh, in my opinion, this is the big change that we are facing in Brazil. And for a bank, for example, Itaú, we, we saw microfinance as a business. I mean, 18% of our economy is very important to us. And more than that, we can do business looking for social impact. So we strongly believe that microfinance can provide resource for uh, productive activity, decreasing violence. For example, we, uh, I live in a city, Sao Paulo is a very big city, and we face uh, the biggest problem that we had in Sao Paulo is violence. So microfinance uh, can do an important role in this scenario. And in Rio de Janeiro, uh, maybe the most uh, famous drug dealer, when they get them and ask, oh, you know, the security system is your biggest enemy. And that guy said, no, it's not the security, but you know, 
the economy. Because when the government, when the companies, the big companies improve the economy, <coughs> I lose my people from a formal job. So I strongly believe in that microfinance can be a strong business model in Brazil and we can change, you know, the life of many people. Okay, thank you, Chris. I think um, Indonesia, as I pointed out before, we have a big challenge in the geography, from the geography aspect. Um, that, that challenge um, in geography aspect um, then resulted in disparities in achieving development goals. Um, not only the MDG goals, but also um, in country specific development goals, um, such as achieving uh, um, education level or delaying the age in, in marriage, um, health, um, reproductive health issue for women and girls. We have those issues where it's, it's very in country specific and very unique. Um, and then also a challenge in infrastructure um, because prior to the MDGs, I don't think the um, goal to have development um, surrounded issue by um, surrounded by issues concerning health and education, that thinking process is not there. So the MDG in in, in um, a, a good way presented new framework that we Indonesians can then um, plot into the development goals, um, domestic development goals. Um, but moving forward um, with the model that we promote, the business model or the development model, um, it, it invites participation from all stakeholders, but also we encourage activism from youth engaging youth to be involved in development. So development is not something that is um, the government is doing, the private sector is doing, only NGO is doing. We tap into youth and use um, mobile um, phones, we use social media to engage them and to um, tweak them how they can get motivated Get, get back that motivation to be involved in what the rest of the country is doing. Um, and, and that way we promote optimism that yes, as, as difficult as it may seem, development targets will be achieved, whether it's, it will be achieved in 2015 or beyond 2015. But if we go into the right direction, then that can be achieved. So we promote, as far as mindset uh, changing, behavior changing, that is what we promote um, because the next generation youth uh, will, will, we depend on the youth um, uh, really to achieve what we have started now. So uh, we engage youth and then we, we prove to them that it's good to have optimism. Um, it's not, optimism hasn't died yet. And as long as you educate yourself, as long as you live healthy, then that targets can be achieved. Um, so we, 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 our, our biggest objective in the model is really to change the mindset. This issue is, needs to be changed. Um, we, one, we want optimism to the mindset to think, to include everyone in, in development. Um, and to engage everyone in communicating well. Um, if we don't practice communication, then we can't do it. If we don't meet each other, then we will not communicate. So that simple, um, uh, simple tips and tricks of, the, of, of partnerships, of movement is what we are trying to promote. And in the longer run, we hope to achieve um, mindset change, behavior change. Because if behavior or mindset doesn't change, then sustainability isn't there. We cannot talk about sustainability if our mindset now, the wrong one, is not changed. So that is what we are promoting moving forward. Great. Thanks, dear.
I said shift in the context of countries, but John, there's also that mindset mm. shift of a, of a large corporation like Anglo-American. Mm. You guys have been out that for a while. What, where are you in that, that journey of changing mindsets around these issues? What lessons do you view have learned from, from maybe companies that are at an earlier stage in that evolution? Yeah, I mean, I think my experience is that people do tend to change their minds and see the value in some of these things once they've been through a situation where it's gone wrong and they realize that actually getting this kind of stuff right, so in our case, getting a social license to operate around our mining communities actually protects you in all sorts of ways that the law or security forces can't protect you. And, 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 and I think that's probably one of the positive things from it, in a sense. One of the reasons why we do this is because it's in our long-term interest to do it. And so the challenge on the mindset side is, you know, how can we work with other stakeholders? And, and you know, Mark was talking about governments, and I, I don't think governments do understand business, but that's not a criticism, because people in business have got no clue how governments work most of the time. And, and that's their national government. Once you get to multilateral agencies, well, really, um, the, the level of ignorance on both sides, I think, is... Is, is very, very high. And, but, but, but I don't think it's, it's not animosity in any sense, because our experience is when we do things that are effective, so our small business development programs, for example, um, we get huge amounts of government backing. So uh, you know, in South Africa or Chile or Brazil, we've had very strong support from um, you know, federal as well as provincial level politicians when we do things. So I think politicians and governments are actually quite pragmatic on the whole. Um, and we need to find a way of maybe as business, find a way of talking a bit more about some of the stuff we're doing, why it's, our, why it's in our interests and why, therefore, it's, it's much more sustainable than a social investment model might be, and why it creates more opportunities to work with governments. And so I think you know, we need to understand why people in government think about business in a certain way. We know that um, you know, the caricature is out there that we're all sort of Gordon Gecko type characters from Wall Street. Um, but similarly, people in business will have similarly um, sort of negative stereotypes of people in government. And, you know, you've been on both sides of the fence. You could probably illuminate this, this, this view. But I, I think business needs to think about how it can actually help, um, particularly the development agencies relevant to this conversation, how we can help them understand a bit more what we do and a bit more about the opportunities to work together. And I'm sure some of that is actually about business raising its standards. You know, it's not as if everything's right and that we do everything right and we don't get the credit for it. We know that all businesses make mistakes and some businesses make lots of mistakes. So there's something around performance, but I do think there's an engagement piece and actually, if we, you know, because our experience is when we get together, then, um, you know, there normally is common ground that we can find to work on. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. First, I want to congratulate the whole organization. This is really a fantastic panel. My name is Eriko Ishikawa. I'm from the International Finance Corporation, and I work in a department that's called Inclusive Business Models. So I couldn't have been more happy than to have every one of you actually talk about this issue. And I really take the point that, uh, you know, this inclusive business model is a title. It may be a little bit strange because when I talk to my own clients and we have 300 companies who have inclusive business models and we tell them we have recognized you as an inclusive business model, they say, wait a second, I'm just a regular business person. I just happen to live in a country where 80% of the people are poor, so don't tell me that I'm doing something extra. I, I am a for-profit company. They almost get a little bit like, I'm not an NGO kind of you know attitude, so I think that the point is very well taken, Abayomi, that in the actual present, in the economic struggles of a business span, the first thing is we want to make a business work. And that's why it's important to talk about business models. And I'm so happy to see that uh, we have Itaú Unibanco. I have been to Microinvest. I have actually visited uh, offices and seen the kind of benefits that happen. And I actually have visited Anglo Zimele and seen some entrepreneurs, so it's a fantastic panel. But I really think that one of the most important points is this mind change. I think that we have to get away from thinking that only NGOs and impact investors can really get impact, that the business sector really has a huge role. And I can tell you that because IFC itself has 300 clients that actually reach 250 million people. And we have invested more than $7 billion. And what I talk about this mind change is that until our unit was created two years ago, we didn't actually look at it from an inclusive business models. We do everything. We do extractive industries. We do agribusiness. We do health and education. But each one is a silo. 
until we created a way to look at our projects and say which ones actually reach the base of the pyramid. We ourselves were a giant you know, financial investor in the private sector, but we have to really change the mindset and make it really very cool to do it. So I think I really think the youth, even for our own staff, to make it like, I want to be doing this. When I did my first project for microfinance over 15 years ago, it was kind of like, why are you doing this? This is not really good for your career. It's not a true investment because the business model wasn't proven yet. But I think we can really prove that there is a business model and that the companies are doing it. Some of the companies are doing it, they don't know they're doing it. Because in their own country, nobody's patting their back and saying, you're doing a good job. But also, you know, not just on the consumer side, but definitely on the supply chain development side. That's where we really have to put a lot of emphasis. And as we saw from the examples of, you know, several companies who are new members, the value chain is, the whole value chain is important. The supply side as well as the distribution side. So I just wanted to... Um, actually ask uh, Eduardo Ferreira mm -hmm. a little bit more about how did Microinvest really come about and change the mindset because it was not that easy at the beginning and I know that. So if you could share that, that would be really great, not just for me but for the rest of the people. And this is a model that's pretty proven. Microfinance is pretty proven. But in Brazil, there are a lot of challenges compared to other countries. So if you could just give us a few words, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in Brazil, we are trying to do a different business model. Usually, microfinance is related to solidary groups and small amounts and you know, all that stuff. But in Brazil, uh, in the south, in the southeast of Brazil, mainly in the south and southeast of Brazil, we are trying to do individual loans and improve a lot of technological uh, uh, things in the business model. So we develop something like we call a hybrid uh, credit analysis model. That means we use all the high contact model using low officers and in the field, combined to geostatistic and statistic tools. So we, we can do business, uh, riskier transactions, we send, you know, a very experienced uh, law officer to identify everything. For low-risk transactions, we can save some money and send somebody who has less experience. So we can handle with the cost of transaction issue. And we are, we now, in the last three or four years, we have a lot of synergy with the bank. In the first moment, basically in the IT platform. And now we are combining the effort in the branches. That means many clients go, goes to, uh, go to the, ban the, the branch and ask for a product that we don't have at the branch. So those guys uh, send this client to the microfinance operation. So we had a kind of win-win uh, relationship with the branch, not only in the retailer side, but uh, the wholesale, because some partnerships start with you know big retailers. For example, we had Açaí, the name of a big retailer in Brazil, and they received a lot of very small micro entrepreneurs, and they don't have a kind of financial product for them. So we made a kind of agreement with them, and we can provide microfinance for those. And when we think about microfinance, we think more than only credit. Now we have insurance, we are looking for uh, the credit card platform, because for the smaller ones, credit card is important in Brazil. As I told, we have a big plastic platform in Brazil. So we are trying to innovate a little bit using IT issues <coughs> relate to the traditional microfinance model. Maybe it's okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity.
My name is Greg Billionis. I work for the World Food Program, and I'm wondering um, how basic human needs fit into enabling environments. Um, if your customers are spending 50, 60, 70 percent of their income on food, um, that doesn't leave much left over for buying products. Uh, does one come before the other? Does economic development lead to uh, greater food security? Or does that issue need to be addressed first? I can, anybody on the panel that wants to take that on and Um, I will try to address that question because um, in Indonesia now we have an um, issue also about uh, food security and nutrition. As you know, um, more than 35% of um, children under 5 in Indonesia is stunted. And uh, mostly that is on the eastern part of um, Indonesia. Um, we try to address that issue with uh, food diversification. Um, yes, about more than 70% of their um, income is spent on food. Uh, but that is because they do not have the knowledge, enough knowledge or enough information um, on how to eat right. What they, um, what they purchase on food is sometimes is not right also. Because we have um, uh, exposure to um, junk foods and um, soda with lots of sugar and stuff like that. So um, in this uh, model that we promote, uh, we try to engage also, I think, WFP Indonesia. We work very closely with WFP office in Indonesia and we, we synergy um, in East Nusa Tenggara that we complement each other on the education side of um, teaching them how to eat right, how to um, it um, uh, compose the composition of their daily nutrition intake um, prior to handling their economy. So we, we um, clear the um, basic human needs, so food and nutrition needs, um, energy and water needs, and then their health needs, and then their education needs, and then we move towards a more specific economic empowerment. So it, it, it has to move in gradual um, terms. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, my uh, colleagues here in the panel also, prior to that, somebody else must have worked on the basic human needs aspect. Because it cannot, I don't think it cannot be, um, it can be um, switched. Because if they are healthy, then they want to get better educated. Um, but in order for them to be healthy, they need to have proper nutrition intake first. So we clarify first, we deal with the um, emergency issues such as uh, food security and energy and water um, um, supply. And then the health aspect. I hope that uh, clarifies. Let me, add, let me add something if I can. Um, I, I also agree with, with, with her that in some households, they actually spend more than 60% of their income on food. But what drives up that price, however, is in some instances, um, what has to go into either the processing, the cost of the processing, or the cost of the distribution before it gets to them. So Nigeria is a, it's a massive country by land mass. And uh, naturally, a lot of people in, you know, in the rural areas would you know, uh, farm, so you know, tomatoes, vegetables, whatever it is. But then comes the first issue, there's no power. So there's no, uh, you know, there's no infrastructure, if you like, to preserve the food. Uh, and so whilst a lot has been planted, a lot has been destroyed right off the back. Um, and then there's no, there's no logistics, you know, infrastructure for them to, uh, you know, move products they cannot consume to e either all the homes or the villages and earn an income. I'll give you a good example. We talk about the cook, cook stoves um, to make you know, food, you know, the finished product. But it can also be used for you know, tier one processing. So fishermen, for example, in Nigeria, there's quite a lot of water in Nigeria. Uh, when the fish is, 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 is pulled out, you know, uh, they actually use kerosene and firewood to do the initial processing so that they can keep it for as long as possible. Uh, you know, and, and that is expensive. So 60% of their income 
many times spent on food is not just spent on, you know, uh, on, on accessing the product, but also on, on the processing, either to keep it or to, you know, make it available for them for tomorrow and the day after. And it spans, uh, you know, almost all products. So cassava is a mainstay of Nigeria. So cassava tubers are planted easily. The temperature allows them to grow quickly. There's very little, uh, you know, care they need. They sprout off the ground and they harvest it very quickly in months. And thousands of farms do cassava. But the tubers need to be processed. They're either, you know, crushed and turned into grain or, or turned into, you know, other things. But there's no, there's no power. The power available, the energy available to do that is pretty expensive. It was back to kerosene, it's back to, it's back to firewood, it's back to coal. You, you understand me? So in my house, for example, uh, my domestics, for example, would use LPG because they've got access to it. But straight down the road, it's firewood and it's the rainy season. So the firewood available, it's already wet. Uh, to get firewood available for you to do any processing, you'll buy at a premium. And, and the only thing stopping you from using LPG is the cook stove, which is essentially the entry barrier, like the mobile phone was you know, in the early days of MTN in Nigeria. So our project, you know, our initiative ties directly to that. So in, in the first instance, it looks like just something for cooking, the finished product, but it, it's big for processing. And then it's also big for, for, for education because the cook stoves, uh, the stoves on top of them can be swapped very quickly for lamps, which are easier and cheaper to use than the kerosene lanterns, which goes back to the same kerosene issues. Or God forbid you'd use a, a fireplace in a, in a hot country. You know, so, and then, you know, indoor pollution that comes with kerosene and with firewood, even for cooking or reading, it's all the same thing. So, you know, whilst we talk about it for domestic use, and we use cooking as a pivot. It's actually for everything. It talks to food security, talks to education, uh, talks to gender equality, talks to almost all the uh, Millennium uh, Development Goals. Thanks for the question. I just had one other perspective from the USAID side, and I think that's that you know, we're very excited about the role of private sector in inclusive business, but we don't pretend that the private sector has all the answers, particularly in the most difficult situations of basic human needs or humanitarian crises. And um, inclusive business can sometimes be a delivery model or it can be supporting a primary role of governments or organizations like World Food Program, um, where something has to be delivered through more traditional development channels. And so. Uh, I think an example is uh, the partnership that USAID and World Food Program have with Pepsi on chickpea production in, in Ethiopia, where private sector is, is producing chickpea production for um, consumer use, but also for a nutritional pace. So that's one innovation that can contribute to food security needs in, in, in the Horn of Africa, but not pretending that the private sector can do it on its own or that inclusive business models can reach the very poorest of the poor in, in all of those situations. So I think there's a degree of humility and perspective around where inclusive business plays a role and, and where business can be a partner, but it's really uh, other stakeholders that are in that, that lead role. My name is Elizabeth Sandor. I'm working in the OECD in Paris. Uh, I would like also to congratulate the organizers for such a, a great discussion. My question would be maybe more for a colleague from Indonesia and Nigeria. Uh, we've been uh, working last year with this uh, global partnership of effective uh, development cooperation, which is now launched, which is actually called support by UNDP and the OECD. And we are now trying to uh, uh, promote uh, the idea of inclusive business, but also inclusion and, and inclusive dialogue in countries between the public and the private sector. How does the private sector can come more systematically and discuss with the public sector in policy setting, being in food? food security, health, or other sectors. And we, we bump into one issue, which is how we monitor progress in the inclusion of private sector in, in that context. And I would like to, to ask you, because you're really working at that level, what would be the best uh, framework, the best criteria for measuring uh, the quality of the dialogue between the public and the private sector when you're actually setting policies and also implementing them and eventually evaluating them? Do you want to go first? Yeah. I mean, um, in my view, in my view, the 
the, the best measure is actually the uh, result, the, the product, the end result. Uh, and this is what I mean. Um, in the first instance, the, 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 the sustainability aspect of inclusive businesses, I think that, that that point is lost. Every time we come into a, an emerging market and talk about inclusive businesses, what, what most businesses think you mean is that you're going to give away money or you're going to give away your business or, or your profit. Uh, so, you know, so right there you hit a roadblock. So you talk about inclusive businesses, even though some businesses are already doing some of it, but once you come in to say it's an inclusive business model uh, and it's something that uh, Business Call to Action is interested in or, or the UN, everybody thinks that this is, uh, this is something that's going to take away from our bottom line at the end of the day. Uh, the truth is that is not the case. Uh, the case, however, is that in the inclusive business model is an enabler for the, for the private sector and indeed it has with it social benefits uh, and in some instances other benefits. So policy formulation, in my view, uh, should be driven from off the back of a commercial or business requirement. So in our case, we uh, wanted to do cook stoves in Nigeria and we went to the government to say, look, the biggest competitor to cook stoves, to clean cook stoves in Nigeria, is kerosene being subsidized. And whilst it is, it's a legal subsidy, we're saying, well, there needs to be a government policy that stops this subsidy. And, you know, and, and we supported that with all sorts of data, you know, uh, specifically at the subsidy and the gains if the subsidy is removed. So I've told you specifically that the subsidy last year on kerosene was $6 million. Uh, and specifically, if we go household by household, we can tell you the average consumption per household and build up all the way back to $6 million and show you how LPG can essentially eliminate that. And so policy formulation must be driven off the back of a business case. So it's no different from uh, setting up the business in itself. Uh, and we find that once that is the case, then there is impetus for us to take it to any uh, you know, executive or legislative person or group to push. Uh, so in our case, for example, in addition to all the things we're doing, there's a massive effort uh, looking at policy formulation, uh, the impact policy uh, can make on this project, the sort of cost, uh, if, you, if you like, towards uh, that formulation, uh, cost in the way of training, in the way of enlightenment, in the way of literature uh, and infrastructure, and also the, the, the benefits uh, once the policy comes in for all the stakeholders. Uh, so the best way to track answering your question directly is actually to treat policy, policy formulation as one of the drivers for the entire business or, or the business plan and see it as you know, something that will or must come in to ensure that the profit or the, the goals of the business model are met. Okay, I will start off with the last point made because I think that is uh, very true. Um, as in other partnerships, I think the inclusive business model where so many partners are involved with so many, so, so, so a variety, a vast variety of backgrounds, I think uh, there needs to be an agreement on how the governance of that partnership will be done because government has um, their um, needs, so does the private sector and the NGOs. And also, um, in, in the case of Indonesia, where the pilot uh, is now being implemented, is also the needs of the operators who are going down at the locations. Um, youth activism, uh, again, I, I touched on that because they are the ones who we recruited online and um, 1,043 um, health professionals, MDs, midwives, and nurses um, answered the call. Um, and from that thousand and more, only 32 are uh, finally recruited and selected. And they are going on, on their, on, to the um, periphery areas in Indonesia. So we are going to deploy them. So there are issues about different needs from different stakeholders in the partnership. So governance, uh, one is 
uh, a, a must that should be agreed between the stakeholders. And also um, an issue about um, who will implement the monitoring and evaluation. In this case, we engage um, an international NGO who has a good portfolio under their belt on um, implementing and uh, monitoring and evaluation with the assistance of um, development partners, in this case, USAID. Um, and then um, this group of people who will then govern the partnership with the um, representation from each of the partners, each of the private sector partners. We have GE, Coca-Cola, um, uh, Nokia on our uh, uh, partnership. Each of those companies send their representative and sit on the board of governance. So we have a group of people who, who um, regularly meet and decide on how they want to govern the partnership and then reach um, an agreement on what is their decision for the partnership. Um, and, and this partnership, again, is formed based on the comparative advantage of each of the partners. So they each bring their expertise into this partnership. They, have, they are experts in their own field. And these experts convene and then determine the KPIs of what the team deployed will have to achieve at the end of each year. What are their interim objective and what are their end of the year objective and how long a commitment each of the partners will put into the, the model. Um, and then also this type of governance and transparency um, promotes um, good position for every partners involved. And we hope that this, this transparency can then be an, an partnership type of partnership where um, um, there is trust more than profit orientation. Uh, it's, we hope that this can be replicated uh, by all partners. This, is, this, this model does not, um, uh, it's not owned by the government. It's owned by each of the partners and we promote each partner to replicate on their own with the assistance of the government. So we assist each other and we provide coaching to, to one another. Uh, and, and I think that is the best way um, where we can all start uh, to answer your question about um, how, how to monitor and evaluate. Uh, but the, the governance system needs to be in place before the, uh, the team is deployed. I think that, and, and, and also the use of um, IT and mobile. Uh, phones, mobile tools, as a um, way of disseminating information, as a way of receiving information um, on, on their needs from the areas to the um, headquarters. I think that's it. Great. Thank you, Dia. Well, I see we're at the, the bottom of the hour, a, a little bit over our time, but I want to thank you all for your questions and engagement. Thank our panelists. Uh, we wanted to talk about enabling environments here today and what organizations in this room can do to create that enabling environment for inclusive business. And I think a clear takeaway we heard from all the panelists was the importance of shifting mindsets. And, and how do we do that? It's building trust between stakeholders. As Dia spoke to, it's about proving the business case um, to business stakeholders, as we heard from, from Yomi and Eduardo uh, and, and others. Uh, and so uh, a big round of applause, please. And thank you to all our panelists for their time. Uh,